Or, oh, it'll probably be an advantage if I don't see them. <laughs> so it'll happen. I appreciate the attendance of those that are here. I usually start out with a story, only this time it's not even appropriate, but I'll start out with it anyway. Sometimes you get a rather flowery introduction, and then I proceed to say that's the second best introduction I've ever had. The first one came when the gentleman that was to do it was sick and couldn't do it, and I did it myself. Well, today I'm <laughs> stuck. I am Elmer Schweeter from the Department of Family Environment, and would like to talk to you a little bit today about the ideas behind the family that at least have meaning and relationship to me. Sort of start out with a story or two, one of the ones that's always tickled me is the one about the wife who had a problem with her husband who drank a lot. In fact, she'd left him on several occasions, didn't work. She beat him on several occasions, didn't work. <clears throat> Done a number of things to try to solve her problem, none of them which were very successful. And so finally she met the local grave digger who said, hey, I know what you can do, lady. The next time I dig an open grave, when your husband comes home and passes out, we'll put him down the hole. When he wakes up and sees where he is, he'll quit drinking. She said, you think it'll work? He said, I don't know, but you've tried everything else. So sure enough, about two o'clock he showed up, passed out in the front couch. They hauled him out, they threw him down the hole. Now, if it hadn't been a wife with that kind of intuition or whatever they have, it might have worked, but she couldn't miss the chance to see what he'd do. So she hid behind a convenient gravestone she waited till morning, just as the sun's coming up at five o'clock in the morning, she hears groans in the bottom of the hole. She leaned over the gravestone closest by and she sees him as he sticks his head over the top and he announced, well, well, judgment day and I'm the first one up. <laughs> Maybe this is judgment day and you can arrive at any decision you like at that one. <clears throat> one of the others that tickles me, I borrowed from a politi political person that I heard speak, said he was sort of Oh, out campaigning. He ran across the story of the man that's in a very small town in Iowa. The man is very strangely attired. He has a big drum out in front of him, mouth organ attached to his face. He plays a trumpet off to the side. He's got cymbals against his knees. He's walking around this small town like mad. He's really hammering up a storm. A number of little kids are following him. It turns out that this man is an itinerant preacher who's having a service, tent service in the community. And finally, one of these little boys said, Mr., who are you? And he said, I'm Reverend so-and-so. And he said, where are you going? And the guy said, son, I'm on my way to heaven. To which the little boy responded, oh, really? How come you're only as far as Altoona? Well, if you're not from Altoona, it maybe doesn't fit too well. But I'll let you decide whether this is judgment day or we're stinging around in Altoona. I'd like to start out by suggesting that I have an object in my hand. As I take it out, you all look at it and you say, well, that's nothing strange. I've seen things like that on numerous occasions. That's a pair of glasses. Now, I may argue with you and say, no, my friend, this isn't a pair of glasses. This is a goomphaw. And you say, well, it may be a goomphaw to you, but it's a pair of glasses to me. And however we put this configuration of ideas together, how you assign your terms or I assign my terms, really doesn't make much difference because you can describe it. You can tell me what it's made of, how it's put together, the kinds of phenomena that goes into it, and what it represents to you. And I'm suggesting to you that we have then a concrete object, something that has meaning and relationship. We can put it together and describe it in that way. But when we get to the family, when we deal with the family, we're caught in a different kind of a world, in my judgment at least. We're caught in a less tangible, more of a conceptual frame of reference. It's an idea. You never saw one. I never saw one. They don't exist. There is no such thing as a family except what you think is a family. Now, from this frame of reference, there is no such thing as a social problem unless you define it as a social problem, which means then to some of our contemporary world, drugs are social problems. But then we have to define what we mean by drug. And we may use hash, we may use pot, we may use alcohol, we may use aspirin. But what we're really saying is that unless you and I agree on what we're trying to define, we're really at odds with each other or might be. 
My argument today is that this is precisely the phenomena that in many ways we confront when we think of a family. It looks to us like it's an idea, but we can only describe a set of relationships. And because we deal with it, deal with it in that way, how we put together the relationships that we call family, if our social interactions change, the needs, the drives, the desires, the things that we're looking for change as well. Let me give you two or three examples of this conceptual notion that I'm working with, and perhaps it'll be even more clear. If you read in the Bible, and you're reading the Old Testament, you may encounter, under numerous circumstances, a statement that says that his name should not pass out of Israel. Now, I don't know what this means to you, but at least one configuration that you can attach to this idea is that to the ancient Hebrew, they did not talk about a nuclear family that starts anew. To the ancient Hebrew, it was important and significant that you talked about a family that was a continuation of the past. Now, from that frame of reference, the story of Moses and the bulrushes takes on some very different kinds of meaning. You then can understand, probably from a mother's point of view, but even more importantly, from a family conceptual point of view, the woman who puts in this little reed bark boat, her babe, because she feels that all the other Jews will be decimated and destroyed. And she wants her son not only to be saved, but she also has this conceptual notion that he is indeed a son, and that the family he represents will not pass out of Israel. And so to her, the social relationship then takes on this notion of passage of time and people through time. Let's try it another way, perhaps. If you read the story Eskimo by Peter Freiken, as you listen to the things that he tells you about the family that he represents and the circumstances under which he has been reared and raised, then he talks about the fact that in this relationship called family, they hunt, and they hunt in a very unique way. They hunt for seals. It's not the kind of a hunt that the Indian could have on the plains where you would go out and go along a roya or bank and wait for the buffalo to come, circle them and surround them, and then hope to get enough food for the whole group, the tribe. To the Eskimo, when they hunt, they hunt in kayaks, in little boats. And the seal is a rather elusive animal, and so as it sits there, you can only catch maybe one or two, and so you hunt in little configurations of four or five. Now, in this relationship of hunting, then, you don't have a great armed party. You have a small number. And in this relationship of hunting, as the Eskimo sees it, <clears throat> it's necessary for someone to come along and to provide a service. In this case, in the illustration that I'm using at least, if the hunter is successful and brings the kill back, then, because they lack the technology to do it in any other way, they masticate the fur with the mouth, and they make it pliable and useful as a blanket or fur or whatever they use for the hide for the walrus or the seal. This is the woman's role on the hunt. And so as you read Peter Freiken's book, you begin to understand that from that frame of reference where you need this relationship, not necessarily man-woman, but that's the roles they've assigned and accepted from this relationship, what you need then is someone that will perform this job and that job. And so then it's understandable, very clearly so, when a man who had been stuck with a harpoon by accident and had a damaged leg and couldn't hunt, and another family, completely different, where the wife was pregnant and couldn't go on the hunt, found it perfectly compatible and acceptable to exchange mates. And the man who, sta who stayed home with the bad leg stayed home with the pregnant wife. And the other man took the other man's wife and went on the hunt. And they find nothing wrong, nothing different, nothing unusual about this relationship because they're talking about a relationship and they talk about the hunting party as a family, the idea, the notion of what's involved in this sort of a relationship. Let's take it another way. <clears throat> if we look at the patriarchal family of the past, a name a means of a name, a means of an extension, and then we talk about the nuclear family of today, we arrive at a very different kind of a relationship, a system of control, if you will. I'm arguing this afternoon that the family has been given a number of tasks 
by all society, but it's how they put them together that makes more of a difference than anything else. Socialization being one, how you rear the young. But even more importantly, it's usually within the configuration of the family, so-called, that we control such things as procreation. Who will be responsible for offspring? Let's talk about that for just a moment because I think it's this kind of a thing that we can look at and then we can, at least in part, understand that as the requirements of the relationship undergo change and differences, then we will see a change and difference in the family itself. The arranged marriage, long gone, or is it, from our society? And if you look back on the history of the arranged marriage versus romantic love, if you will, you'll find patriarchies, kingdoms established about uh, various relationships. They exclude the notion of love or they, they expect it to happen. For the orderly transgression of the society, they arrange these things that we call marriage. They do too. Do they mean family by this? If we look upon them as a source of codifying power between two groups or to somehow culturally assume some of the other dimensions that are there. The arranged marriage serves very functionally then if part of your problem or part of your relationship is to somehow cement together or to assign some of these responsibilities. Let's look further. We talk about these relationships of yesterday. I'd like to argue for a moment that it was an awfully lot easier, very much easier to be a family on the frontier than it is right now. Why was it easier? easier for a variety of reasons, at least one of which was because the roles and the responsibilities were either less in scope or more known and understood in purpose and function. Now, I don't want to go back, and I'm sure my wife and family doesn't want to go back to the day where you get out the bucket and you heat it on the stove, and then you get out the wash bucket and you do all of the washing in that manner. I recognize they had a tough life. But I'm arguing from this position that it was an awfully lot easier to be a family member. What did you need to know, my friend, about the man? Could he farm? Could he fence? Was he an effective agriculturalist? Was he a reasonably good proponent of animal husbandry? Could he make a living for you in that new land? What did you need to know about the wife? Could she cook? Could she pan? Could she store? Was she effective in being able to take the produce that you produced from the guts and works of your hand and see to it that you live throughout the summer, throughout the winter, until the next spring? Looking at it from that point of view, we had some euphemistic or atavistic survivals that were around. I'm sure that at least some of you in this room have seen, maybe some of you still have, what was conveniently called a hope chest. What did you have in it? How did you define, you know, I referred to it for my good wife as a despair barrel, which doesn't make her feel very good about the whole thing, but what was in that hope chest? What kinds of skills and trades and crafts did you have that you demonstrated then to those that were uh, at least in the marketable relationship called marriage that you could do? Well, so what I'm suggesting to you then is that the family as I perceive it is in a state of transition or change as we find the needs of the people who enter into this relationship called marriage changing. And if we'll look then at some of the needs that change, perhaps we can understand some of the ideas that change. Let me take another example and I recognize that I'm pulling these out of the top of the air that sometimes there are many more ramifications than I either have time to or probably knowledge of in terms of applying them. Many of us in this room are married. <clears throat> when you married, what did you agree to? Now, I'm not asking about whether you sat down and said the man is the head of the house and Christ is the head of the church. I don't mean it in that way at all. But I do mean it that most of the time, in the Christian ethic at least, when you talk about marriage, and I talk about marriage, we agree to a relationship between people to a very specific end which stops right here and is called, till death us do part. Now, that's an interesting concept to deal with for a moment. And I deal with it particularly because to most of us then, 
at the time of death. Another relationship, if you choose to, can build upon that last one, can start anew. What difference does it make? But suppose you had a concept of a marriage which meant that tomorrow, after death of both partners, you're joined again in another place, and for convenience we'll call it heaven. Suppose you had an idea then, my friends, that once again you would start a relationship anew in this place called heaven, and you had married either spouse, lost the other, and married a second time. How do you get over the problem of monogamy? One man, one woman. You get over it by agreeing to a problem or a relationship called polygyny, polygamy. That is the belief of the Mormon brethren. Now it's important, not because we agree with their ideas, but it's an intriguing kind of a concept, at least to me, because they do believe. They have the best genealogical records on earth, exclusive of some federal and far superior to many state and federal organizations. I had the occasion, and I still got it in my desk, I guess I should copy it out and send it off. Our home on Donald Street, I got a letter addressed to someone that was long gone, and I asked around, no one knew who the heck they were, and I opened it up to see what it was, and it's a letter written by someone who is obviously Mormon to someone who was obviously Mormon that lived formerly, apparently, a long time ago at our address. I'm intrigued with the thing because of the technology and the degree of, well, plain out, very deep-seated and very involved kinds of things they want to know. Second cousins, third cousins. In other words, if you knew all of the material that's needed to fill this out accurately, you've got a very accurate picture of your genealogy of the past. And I'm suggesting to you that to the Mormons who up until 1909 had the conviction and belief of multiple marriage, who also had the conviction of belief that you're re reunited a second time and you go on in a lifestyle, at least as they conjure it up, like the one you had here, you had to deal with the problem they did. The rest of the United States, states felt that their attitudes were wrong. Let's look at a couple of other ideas in this same notion. As most of you in this room know, my wife and I have been long involved, now near four years, with the Old Order Amish in Iowa. Prior to that period of time, we had had the wonderful and rare occasion to live in South Dakota and got acquainted with a few of the Hutterites, not to the level or degree that we know the Amish. We've enjoyed this. We've sort of conjured up an idea about their relationship and about their beliefs and their convictions, which applies to their family as well. We've put together a frame of reference that I'm sure others have used, but at least to us, we think it's new, and so we're going to call it new and tell you tell it differently. We call it retainers, reformers. We're looking at utopian peoples, folks who have lived before and tried to reestablish a relationship, produce a new one, or contain the old. The Amish and the Hutterites do a beautiful job of what Dorothy and I call the retainers. They've decided they've reached a point of utopia. We won't go into this. But they're saying we don't want a change in the world of tomorrow. And because they don't, they're saying we're satisfied with our world of yesterday, and by the way, these happen to be the two most successful utopians on earth, contemporary-wise, number-wise. They're not dying out, they're growing like mad. Now, they have some other convictions that fit in with this, that have something to do with our attitudes and their attitudes about this relationship called, excuse me, called family. Most other utopian groups sought converts. They looked effectively for proselytization, not the Amish, not the Hutterites. They do not proselyte. They do not seek converts. Therefore, there is only one way for their culture and society to grow, and that's to have an ethic of large families, and both do. Dorothy and I have seen what? Family of 25? Numbers of these kinds of things. Maybe not 25, 15 anyway. 20. They keep kidding each other about it. The point I make with you is that they follow their ethics and their beliefs that if you don't go out for converts, you favor large family size, and it serves a very functional purpose for them. If we look at it in another way, and I'll use again an Iowa group. Now many of you in this room have been to Amana. You may as well have studied some of the Amana culture and you've looked a little back and passed into their history and, and their ideas. If you look a little deeper, you'll discover that the Amana before the 32 break 
was a very different manner than most of us conjure up as we go to visit the, the Coke ovens and the woolen mill and the furniture factory and so on. They too were a unique group. They were different in some intriguing kinds of ways. One, they came to Ebenezer, New York. They settled there. Some controversy arose about the land that they had purchased as to whether they owned, had true ownership. Rather than argue and get into that kind of a thing, they sent scouts out. They arrived in Iowa. They decided this was the place and they built. Then on 28,000 or 22, 28,000 acres plus, the Amana Society that you and I know, the seven villages. But some intriguing things happened. My title was There's Nothing New Under the Sun. And my point is that these people were confronted at that point in time with the notion that they did not want to expand. The 28,000 acres was all they had. They then invented or involved themselves in a system of family relationships that for that period of time, and even today perhaps, was very different. What was it? They decided to discourage marriage and family, not entirely. But they well knew that they had a finite existence, and if they allowed large family sizes, they would rapidly overpopulate their 28,000 acres. And so they made it difficult for marriage. If a couple decided that they were interested, if the relationship called family was rapidly approaching, they'd move the man to one village and the woman to another. If they wanted to get together, they had to walk after a full day's work, sometimes an hour, an hour and a half walk back and forth. They still meet in the separate men on one end, women on the other end, in a very plain, unadorned religious building called the church to them. It's the church to us. It's very, very plain, a coal stove over in the corner. They did some things even within their religious ethic that would discourage large family sizes in contrast to the Hutterat and the Amish who encouraged them. If you had had a child, you sat in the front of the pew. The longer the period of time between your last child and those in the community who had had children subsequently, you kept working your way back in the church. And if you hadn't had children for a while, you got to the back row. But the minute you had another one, they dumped you back in the front. And as one person who was telling us about this said, some people were in transition the whole time. They spent a lot of time going from the back to the front. But my point, of course, is that in looking at this sort of an idea, in looking at the family then from the point of view of what is the society asking the family to provide? What are the needs of the contemporary situation? What are the needs of yesterday or tomorrow? It's my argument that if we sort of apply our thinking or our, our ideas in this dimension, we might anticipate some things. Let me try it in this way, more to the contemporary theme. It wasn't very long ago that I visited a very intriguing spot that was called the House of Tomorrow. It was put together by a commercial firm. Interesting sort of a thing. They were setting up. Now that's businessmen telling you women what the house should look like. Contemporary more or less. In the House of Tomorrow they had a vacuum cleaner about the size of yours, a canister type. When you built the house you buried a wire underneath the rug. You planned it to go around such things as the fireplace, all permanent obstructions. It sat in a little room or a little cubby hole off to the side of the wall, had an antenna on the top, and was battery operated. Took time to vacuum your rug, got it out, tipped the antenna up, the battery took off and went all around the house, came back, went back in the hole, tipped it down, the battery shut off. Didn't have to vacuum on that. Nice. The Amana Society was. I don't know who was a man or which one was there. They had an interesting stove. You've got one like this in your own home or can have one. If you want to go home tonight for a nice warm meal, you set the meat in the stove and you set the oven and you could be gone all day. And when you get back, the oven's gone off and you've got a nice meal. But suppose you wanted to be gone for a month for vacation and you want a warm meal. Well, they're working on it. This particular stove was a deep freeze and a refrigerator as well. You could put the meat in the top, set your timer up to 30 days. It remained hard frozen. The timer went off, the refrigerant got pumped somewhere, and the stove went on. You can come home 30 days from now and have a warm meal. You can buy now at Sears and Whirlpool a device that you can set in your home. It, you don't have to carry out the garbage anymore. It will compact it. And as it goes down, it will give it a little spray of something so it doesn't smell for a week. 
I was intrigued with this. Kimberly Clark was there, the paper company. They had a job that would help you ladies a good bit. They decided that they had a paper product that was as soft as and as comfortable as a sheet. So you don't change sheets anymore. You got a roll at the foot and a roll at the head and a button on the end of your bed. And when you want to change sheets, you go up and you push the button and brrr, it rolls on a nice new roll. Point I make is this. In that home of tomorrow, the job of the housewife, the cleaner upper job of the housewife, could be accomplished in seven minutes. Now, I'd like to switch that around just a little bit. If we were able to do the same thing today, and the job that the men do in our society only demanded seven minutes of their attention, was only that important, you think we'd change the family relationship a little bit? What are we saying about the role of the traditional wife when we say, my friend, the, th the things and tasks that are important to you can be accomplished that quickly? They're not stupid. They're not ignorant. They got the same life, 24 hours to live that you and I do. And if it can be accomplished in seven minutes, they've got an awfully lot of time to be occupied to otherwise spend. And my argument at this point, of course, is that if we look at it from that way, then perhaps we can anticipate or could have some of the notions and ideas of women's lib. There's a firm in Chicago that has made the decision that it's very expensive for the man to come downtown. In fact, they discovered that their top executives, when they came to town and worked in their plush offices, really didn't interact with anybody else very much. They did it all by telephone calling back and forth within the building. And they found that they could probably save that man an hour and a half on the freeway and a lot of frustration. So they teamed up then with a TV outfit. And you've seen split screen where you see something going on here and they split your TV screen so you see what went on in another place. Well, this one is split 12 ways with the man on the other end, man on the extending end being the 13th person. So that if you want to talk to your boss, push a button, you get two people. You can talk to up to 12 people at one time. Each one comes up in a little box, a communication system that goes on face to face. The important point to me is, if the executive comes to work not every day, once per week, maybe not that often, maybe once every two weeks, he works in his own home. He has in his own home a little machine that looks like a dictograph or an addressograph when he wants something from his secretary, who does come to work every day, by the way, he says, get me so-and-so out of the file, and she walks over and she shoves it in the file down at the work, and the machine down at work, the copying machine's in his, off in his home office, comes out there, he reads it, signs it, puts it back in, and she gets a signed copy, and they go on from there. What happens to a world of a family if the man's home 24 hours a day? He doesn't go to work, he does it at home. The kinds of technology that gives us a change or a different sort of an idea, if we look at that way. <clears throat> what will be affected if the family undergoes these kinds of changes? Is the family dying out? Not in my book. What I'm suggesting to you is that what is, on the other hand, happening is a whole new set of ideas that have a relationship to the family. Alimony, the old traditional story that says, well, I gave you the 10 best years of my life, and the guy said, if those are the 10 best, I don't want any more. Well, maybe that's not exactly what's happening. Is alimony coming on stream? No. Child care, child support, I'm not talking about. I'm talking about the kind of a statement that was made many, many years ago, which said, look, the woman is unable or that member of the relationship is unable to support herself, you've cared for her, taken her out of the, of the labor market, now you owe her somehow an erstwhile existence for the next X years. It's not the case anymore. And the students that I encounter in the classes at this university when I raise the issue of alimony, most of them say, no, I wouldn't take anything from him. I'm able to make my own living. Child support, yeah. But this kind of a payment that used to be made in terms of uh, an injured party is a different sort of a thing. I'll give you another contemporary one. We interviewed in our department the other day a very delightful young lady who uh, 
happens to be a lawyer in a distant another state, Kentucky, as a matter of fact. And in talking with her, I said, look, I'm interested because I know you've done a number of cases of divorce. You've been involved in a number of uh, divorce cases. Tell me, what's the effect of the no-fault divorce law? And her, and her statement was, well, the place that I can tell you more about it is California because it's been there longer, not in Kentucky where she was from. But the effect that she saw, if we ask her to capsulize it in a hurry, the effect that she saw was simply this, that under the no-fault divorce law that is now effective in our society, in our state, which was to reduce and eliminate the kind of acrimony and all of the arguments and fights that went on, you know, between it's your fault I get to share, no, it's your fault you get to share, and all this kind of hassle. As she saw it, the most effective sort of thing that happened was simply this, that with no fault, there is no way to stop a divorce, period. Now, maybe that's good. But her issue was this, that under the older conditions, one could say, well, try it for another year and six months, see if you can make it go. When one party can walk in and say, it's all over, it's done, then the judge may say, well, I think your mate is trying and wants to really make it work. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to let you have this fault at the moment. No, I suggest you try it for another six months. Okay, they try it for another six months. Her point was simply this that the best you can hope for under no fault is that you delay a divorce, but there is absolutely no way to stop a divorce. And I think that's an interesting point, because I don't think this was brought out. Maybe it should have been, maybe we're wrong, maybe it's not that critical or that big a dimension. Let's look at it in another way. <clears throat> when we talk about controlling the relationships that are around in the contemporary scene, in the family of yesterday and the family of tomorrow, I can remember some things that happened when Dorothy and I were first married. My good mother, who was a wonderful human being, either started her telephone con conversation, her personal confrontation, or her letters were all started out the same way. Is there anything you want to tell me? Because she was plumb gung-ho that she was going to be a grandma come hell or high water. And the longer we kept delaying this process, the more upset grandma got. And there wasn't anything that pleased Grandma more than to suddenly know that, yes, indeed, Dorothy's pregnant and you're going to be a grandma. In other words, out of her frame of reference, this was simply an assumed relationship of a marriage and family. To her, she could not conjure up a relationship between a man and a woman that didn't include children. This was just part and parcel of the package. Maybe she's right. Maybe she's not. The point I make with you is that we now find an awfully lot of people maybe following some of the same notions of our friends from Romana that say, hey, wait a minute, we're reaching an overpopulation saturation point. Maybe we are, maybe we're not. But if you think we are, that does something to what you do to that relationship called marriage. Let's put it this way. We could argue, and I'm sure I would raise a lot of ire and step on a lot of toes if I stomped around in the good, the bad, the evil, or whatever else is involved in the pill. I don't want to go to get into the controversy of whether the pill causes any kind of premarital excesses or not. Let's just keep it within the frame of reference of the family, the married couple themselves. We have produced, provided for the young generation that are now out in front of us, that look at the family of tomorrow. For the first generation on the face of the earth, they not only can control family size, they have a technique to do it that is relatively successful. Why would this be important? And the young people that I encounter in class day after day, when we get down to the nitty gritty of talking about it, they find nothing wrong, no problem whatsoever in saying, when we get married, I plan to work for five years and then we're gonna have kids or we're not going to have any, or we're going to have two, or whatever else. And I'm suggesting to you, friends, that this is the first generation on God's green earth that can make that kind of a statement with the degree of certainty that they can. Now, whether you agree with the use of contraceptives, whether you agree with the use of the pill, doesn't make any difference to me, and it doesn't make any difference to them either. They're using it. The evidence is loud and clear in a whole variety of studies and past examples that come out. The birth rate for various groups is dropping rather drastically, and it's dropping, by the way, very drastically for the Roman Catholic community. 
who, if you listen to all of the material that comes out, would apparently not be involved in this degree of control. Obviously, this is not totally true. And so I'm suggesting to you that what's changing in the family is a conceptual notion of a relationship between the couples that we see today, the people that are involved. The so-called modern experiments, the nuclear family, the chain, so on. I'd like to work for just a minute with this and then pass on to the last portion of what I'd like to present this afternoon. As we see the nuclear family developing and increasing, whether she's right or wrong, Margaret Mead and others have said that the nuclear family destroys a relationship that allows you and I some relief from the total 24-hour day care of that family, mother, father, and children. Now, she explores this dimension out of such things in the past as extended families, aunts and uncles. My aunt happens to be here today, and she darn well knows that as a kid growing up, if she took me to the zoo and uh, she thought I needed spanking, I got spanking. She was the extended family. She darn well knows that as far as my parents were concerned, if I went to school and I screwed up and I got spanked at school and my dad heard about it, when I got home, I got it again because he just saw the school as an extension of the family. In other words, he could trust most of the people that I interacted with and that he interacted with to do a reasonably good job of at least pseudo-parenting me because he didn't have to worry about, worry about a whole world of new people, wondering whether, well, if I let them go off with them, will they take care of them, will they watch them? He knew his world. My mother knew his world. This personal relationship, now I'm arguing that in some ways, as I conceive it, we are not asking the extended people that we know to do these things. We're asking the formal structures that we produce to do these things, i.e., we put a kid, youngster, very small child, three years old in the daycare center. Now, we can argue whether this is right or wrong. The point is, instead of saying to the neighbor, will you watch the kids when I go downtown and tomorrow I'll watch your kids, we turn around and say, let's develop a formal organization called a daycare center and trust them to do it. We provide some interesting dimensions of this as I look around. <coughs> I'm reminded of the gal that was talking about the daily vacation Bible school. And it so happened that their daily vacation Bible school was the last two weeks before school started again in September. And she was rattling about the kids who came in. <clears throat> now it turned out that she had one young boy that came to their vacation Bible school and just for purposes of illustration, I'll call it Luther and it wasn't, but I'll call it that. So the little boy came, mother rolled him, you know, and she said, are you Luther? And the kid said, no. Why are you coming to our vacation Bible school? Turned out, this good mother looked for the whole summer of some place to substitute parents. And so for the first two weeks, it turns out that the Roman Catholics had a vacation Bible school, and she enrolled him there. The next two weeks, the Baptist had one. She enrolled him there. And she had carefully sought all of the, all of the, all of the community, you know, all of the vacation Bible schools, and she didn't care what flavor they were. She wanted to know what their time span was. By the time he got to the last one, he was a fairly eclectic kid, as you can imagine. You know? <laughs> Somewhat confused, I imagine, by the time they start to tell him about church. And I don't what they said over there. You know? Well, I don't care what they said over there. What do they say over here? I'm arguing that one of the conceptual changes that the nuclear family is really producing, without our awareness in some ways, is a very clear kind of a statement that says, look, is it possible for a man and a woman to be able to mother or father children all the time? Because we have destroyed the relationship of what I would call neighborhood that used to substitute for that. Both my wife and I lived for a while. She was born reared there, and I lived for a good bit of my time in South Dakota. I can tell you in just quick passing that to the American Indian, they use the neighborhood concept of father and mother. I remember the lady that left, was completely gone for two days. To me, that was a terrible mother. It, it turned out that the kid was gone and somebody came through selling potatoes or tomatoes or something and the man got an offer to drive a truck and he said to his wife, do you want to go? And she said, sure, they got in a truck, they drove to Sioux Falls. She got back two days later. The welfare worker informed our agency 
that this mother had abandoned her kid for two days. When we went to check on it, that wasn't what happened at all. Now, she did not tell the kid where she was going. The youngster got home from school or wherever he was and didn't know where their mother and dad was, but he darn well knew that he could go down the block, knock on the door, and say to the Indian lady in the next house, my mother and dad aren't around, can I stay here tonight? And she'd say, sure. Because maybe next week she'd be gone for two days. In other words, I'm arguing that this relationship of the nuclear family puts an awful lot of pressure that we used to be able to expand out in neighborhood contacts and neighborhood support groups that are gone now. And we're formalizing it. We're putting it another way. Well, let's look at tomorrow and call it quits. What about the longer life expectancy? My friends, I'm all in favor of the kidney transplant machine. I'm pretty well impressed with the, the pacemaker. If something happens to me, I hope like sin that somebody will have enough money, whoever somebody is, to put the machinery together so I can live out. Because I don't want to die either. Certainly not for the next little while. But what's happened? Every town in Iowa has a graphic description. You don't have to ask the people. All you have to do is fly over, drive through, and it's seated on the edge of your town. It's called a rest home. That relationship is there for a number of reasons, one of which, at least, is that it used to be, when you retired at 60, they gave you a watch, and you didn't live to see the watch quit working. But not anymore, life is going further. Life expectancy is greater. Which means that we now have a whole set of relationships because we can do some of these things that we've never had to confront before. There was always a few people that lived a long time, but now we've got a massive number of people who live a long time. And it's nice to talk about the family of yesterday, but back at the turn of the century, or back at the time this country was founded, you were an old man at 45, and most of the people were gone at 60. Not now. And I'm arguing we have done a number of things which have changed that whole notion, that whole idea. Let's try just one or two more. If we look at it from the point of view of the technology that now looks far out, but there's at least five human beings from Iowa alone that have been convinced that in their best interest, or in somebody's best interest, upon their death, they should be placed in liquid hydrogen or helium or whatever they use and frozen. Now, I don't know if they're ever going to come back. I wouldn't want to take my chances on the operation, but then on the other hand, if it's a terminal thing anyway, I might try. But these people have paid their five to $8,000 for the immediate placement, and they're paying or put in trust fund enough money to keep this thing perpetuating. And they have some kind of a hope that someday they can come back, 20, 30, I don't know how many years from now. I'd only ask you one very pragmatic question. If they are revived, if it works for the first guy or the first woman, what's it going to do to our whole legal system of inheritance? The guy died, he comes back, he says, I want to spend my money, and they say, sorry, your horse ran last. You know, I spent it on him. He says, don't give me that stuff. I'm back now. I'm alive again. Ask an insurance agent about him. He said, no, we won't sweat on it. We'll just turn around. We don't have any experiment or experience with it, but we'll write him out a new policy. <laughs> you know, rates are going to be a little high, but if he comes back, we'll just start from where we are now. Same old idea and we'll see if we can perpetuate it for tomorrow. We've had an awful lot of people with an awful lot of ideas. There's nothing really new under the sun. If you look hard enough, most of the kinds of things that we see existing today in various kinds of groupings, new configurations, have been thought through, some successfully, more often than not, not successfully. The Shakers had a whole idea. If you look at the needs that the Shakers were trying to meet, they were talking about a marriage, a group of people, a family, an idea. If you look at the Oneida community, some of these things that we're talking about aren't that new with stirrup culture, with clan propagation. If you look at the communitarians or the Icarians, if you look at today's contemporary hippies, if that's the best term that's by far not the best one, but those who are living in different configurations of the family, if you get beside what they're doing, 
which is more often the thing that disturbs me. And by the way, I'm just traditional enough that my son who's seated right back there now and my daughter who's out riding a horse, if either one of those characters come wandering home and say, hey, Pa, you know, guess what I'm doing? Uh, you're not going to find one happy pop slapping them on the back saying that's the greatest thing since the invention of night baseball. But if I get behind what, what worries me, morally and ethically, and I start to say to myself, why is this happening? What does it represent? What needs are they trying to meet in a personal relationship? Then all of a sudden, my world begins to come together in a new focus. I'm suggesting to you that in looking at the family of yesterday, many needs were met. In looking at the family of today, many more needs are met. And looking at the family of tomorrow, the needs, the concept of marriage, the concept of family, undergoes some new dimensions as you add in new problems. We haven't said a thing about mobility, I won't, you know. We haven't said a thing really very specifically about what is happening to the contemporary young people. I quit with saying that as far as I can see, they are seeing a whole set of new needs. They are asking the same kinds of questions that you and I ask about a family. I've worked with a number of them. It's been a rare privilege. I have yet to encounter the first young couple that may be living in the most unusual social situation or circumstance, one that I would find great difficulty accepting for myself or my own members of my family, but I have yet to find the first couple that came along with the idea that marriage is family is to be thrown aside. It's to be tried out like a streetcar. We'll ride it as long as it's going our way, and when it doesn't work, we'll just get off and catch another when they're going the other way. They are sincerely motiv motivated to make the relationship work. They are as disturbed about the high divorce rate that you and I are. They are saying, hey, the family today has got another set of dimensions to it. We want to try to meet him. We're trying to do, within the no norms of our ability, we're trying rather desperately to see if we can find the key so it'll last. And that's sort of my terminal point. I'm convinced that the family is a social institution. I am convinced that as needs change, as ideas change, the family changes. And as we look at the ideas that put up and make up and conjure up in your mind and mine, this is a family. They're going to be different. You can't go home again, the name of the book. They don't want to go back again. I'm not sure I do either. As I said earlier, I don't want to go back to the frontier. But it must have been an awful lot easier when the roles and relationships were so clearly defined. Let me quit with one final story. As far as I can see, we're sort of in a problem. Maybe it isn't serious. It's been a very patient, very attentive audience. It's been a delight to talk to you, and so I'd like to sort of end up with this sort of a story. Seems as if gentlemen always went home through the graveyard. And on his trip home, which he made at night, he carried a lantern until he learned the pathway very clearly. Then he left his lantern, he used to just shortcut through the graveyard. Done this for years, didn't pay any attention to it. And this night he's cruising along, and unbeknownst to him, right in the middle of the path, they cut a brand new grave. He fell in. No rock box, no anything. Eight feet, you know, without the frame and so on. Now he tried to get out, and he didn't have any luck. He scratched, and he wasn't having any luck. He called out, nobody came to his assistance, so he finally decided the only thing to do was go over in the corner, Wait for morning, and he'd get the gravekeeper and the groundskeeper to come and lower a rope or a ladder. So he went over in the corner and ultimately fell asleep. Now it happened that a second man also used that path. He didn't know anything about the hole either. So the second man came along, and he fell in the hole. And he scratched around at the bottom of the hole, and his activities and exercises awakened the first man. And the first man thought that since they shared a common plight, the least he could do was explain to the second man that they were down there till morning. So the first man got up, walked over to the second man, touched him on the shoulder, and said, Friend, you can't get out of here. But he did. Thank you very much. <laughs>
usually safer to run. But uh, any comments, statements, questions about? talk about living generationally, you're talking about several generations configuration totally together over against the so-called commune where you have all of the same age living together. I guess my observations on this would simply be that as I see the communes all of the same age living together, what they're striking out for is the assistance from the commune, the assistance of somebody else to help them get the job done. Uh, As far as the generationality is concerned, that has been the thing that's held it together. The Amish do this as a matter of course. If you get down to Cologne or Pulaski or any of the other major communities, you will find that they not only have a home, they have attached to it what they call a grandpa house. Now, it's a unique kind of a configuration because it has all of the accoutrements of a single house. It has the kitchen and all the rest of these things. In other words, they don't come together usually unless of necessity, somebody's sick or hurt or something, they don't come together for uh, a common kitchen. It'd be a kitchen the other one more often than not. And they're living, as far as I can see it, and as far as intergenerationally is concerned, I'm arguing, or at least I would say, I'm confronted with the question, that this has been the traditional way of expanding out and, and reaching out to each other for help and assistance. But we don't do that now. And I think there are a number of reasons why. One is the, that our culture does such a darn good job of saying these privately dependent. Uh, I've got a basement full of crap and corrosion and, and tools. They're welcome to my friends to borrow any time. And yet, I know, as a matter of fact, that, that people find it difficult to come and say, hey, Elmer, can I use something? Why do they find it difficult? Because they'd rather get it themselves. I've got some trash down there. My neighbor next door had probably as good a workshop as I've got, maybe in many ways better. And yet I, I was very uncomfortable going to this guy. If I, if I need some help going, you know, I run out of gas or I want to call somebody, I got a pocket full of credit cards that say you belong to AAA or 4-H or whatever it is, you know, 3B, 2C, FOB, you know, and I'll go use those because I don't really feel very good and I think we've culturally done this. I don't really feel very good of calling back to my neighbor and saying, hey, would you help me? I'm out of gas. When's the last time you asked for help from anybody? Yeah, that's a symptom of what, what we do. You know, if you're not producing, you're not a whole person. Could you be comfortable? We've got a work ethic that's beat into it. 
So heck wouldn't have it. Would you, are you married? Would you be comfortable with a husband that, uh, let's say, when you marry, he inherits a half million dollars and he's never going to work another day in his life? You know somebody like that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you could get one. Huh? Like you could be comfortable right now. You would be perfectly happy if you never worked. Sure. I, I really think that, you know, that, that the other part, the, you, you ask, you're bringing up another crisis, and that is, you know, I really don't care about the work ethic. Work ethic. I didn't grow up having to care about the work ethic, and the technology doesn't make the work, that work ethic make any sense. Would your mother and dad be happy with it? I don't know if I share. You <laughs> share. Any other questions? I'm sure I haven't answered yours. You know, I really, I really see these communes and these things as an extension of people saying, hey, doing it yourself 24 hours a day is doggone rock going. And we are. I agree with that. I just, I, I'm, I mean, it's, it's a curious thing to me, and I think that, that, that there is very much a crisis in the families, and I think very much that crisis comes from. Isolating. It's isolating. And, and the reason we do that is, you know, who's out in the suburb? You don't find grandpa and grandma out in the suburb. You go out there and you're going to find a, what, a range of 15 years at the most? Everybody out in Ding Dong Acres is about the same age. Now, once in a while, you'll get a, a little scattering, but not very much. Uh, we, we've essentially sort of said, this is my group. My argument is that we lack the ability, really, to see any value in the elderly. Um, we call upon them very rarely for anything they can produce, but they're also a fairly new phenomenon in terms of large numbers, really large numbers of people, which we've got now. We have well, it's also a fairly large phenomenon, I mean, recent phenomenon. I mean, We also turn, I think, in another way and use the Bible again. Who came after Christ's body as mother? You know, as a family used to take care of from cradle to grave. Now, I'm not arguing if any of you happen to have a parent or person who works in the mortuary business, but the old order Amish, they take care of from cradle to grave. They'll pick them up. If they've died in university hospitals, we talked to a mortician in one of the communities, and he said, I was asked to go get the body, but when I brought it back, I didn't take it to a mortuary, I took it to their home. They dressed it, they cared for it, they buried it, the whole thing. Uh, the only reason I was asked to get it is because I had a hearse, and it was when the child died, or the person died a distance away. Otherwise, they take care of, what have we encountered now? I think five or six or at least five or six homes where they have nursing, you know, the whole bed. The, the bed up and the doctor comes and they got that whole array of, of medicine and they take care of them in their own home. They really are reaching for this, but they're staying within their culture. They turn to each other like men. A very supportive culture of other arms. But they turn to the outside world only when they have to, and not on the church. Probably partly true. The other thing that intrigued me in looking at that, you read Walden too, revisited in some of the others. There's just plain a gutty number of things that have to be done. You know, and I usually argue that it doesn't make any difference who takes out the garbage, but it makes a hell of a difference if it doesn't get taken out. And so you've got a system going then when certain things are absolutely necessary for people to live together, and they spend an awful lot of time mechanically deciding how many credit points you get for you know, doing the dirty work over against the nice job. And it takes a certain amount of living together to realize that, hey, there are tasks to be done. I mean, and that's good. And I, I think if you look at the young community groups, a lot of them are pretty much idealistic. 
They were going to live in, in complete harmony, and nobody was going to take out the garbage. It was just going to be kind of like the ideal existence. You're going to pick the pie off the tree, and that works as long as you've already got the pie on the tree. But if somebody has to get the juice out of the ditch, you know, the whole series of things would happen. Any other comments, statements? It has been delightful. Thank you for your questions.